Welcome to this Clavister Protects webinar about zero trust in the remote working era. Remote working has become a normality for many of us during the outbreak of this terrible COVID-19 pandemic. Everything is done from home, internal meetings, client business meetings, cabinet meetings, study sessions, and even evaluation talks between parents and teachers. And most experts agree our reality has likely changed forever, or at least for a long time. But remote working as such is not new, of course. And from a security perspective, it has received a lot of focus the last 10 years. Now is the time to bring all this together and for everyone to start using the innovations and feel digitally safe wherever you are. In this webinar, we will cover what Zero Trust is and how do we provision access based on identities. Explain that Zero Trust is ideally delivered by elastic security in an Esteban architecture. And show that MSSP are the perfect partners to deliver elastic security, Esteban, to customers and the Zero Trust philosophy. My name is Anne Klang and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. With me, I have my colleague and commercial solution manager at Clavister, Mr. Thomas Vossum. Thomas has a long history in high tech business, working with service providers, operation data, operations, data mediation, telecom billing, and customer experience solutions. For the last, 10, for the last three years, he has worked at Clavister, and is responsible for our Aurora portfolio. Thomas will be our main speaker today. And if you have questions for him during the presentation, please type them in and I'll be able to ask them in the end. Thomas, please take it away. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect, great. Today's topic is zero trust networking. The Zero Trust Network, or the Zero Trust Architecture, uh, is a model that was actually already created back in 2010 by a gentleman called John Kindelag, who at the time was principal analyst at Forrester Research, an analytic company. Now, 10 years later, Zero Trust is seen as one of the big uh, frameworks in the cybersecurity industry. Zero Trust states that organizations should not automatically trust anything inside or outside its perimeters. And instead, must verify everything and anything trying to connect to the systems and the data before granting access. Currently, Zero Trust networking is a concept for secure network connectivity where the initial security posture has no implicit trust between different entities regardless of whether they are inside or outside the enterprise perimeter risk optimized access to allowed um, uh, risk optimized access to network capabilities is dynamically extended only after assessment of the identity uh, with regards to the entity, the system, and the context, three combined. We'll dive into that more. But first, what is trust? A definition. Trust is a bi-directional belief established between two entities that the other entity is what it claims to be and that it will behave in expected ways during, um, uh, during the interaction. Uh, trust leads to access uh, to capabilities between the entities that otherwise would not be possible. That's a mouthful, but really key to understand and remember. Trust is not necessarily a good thing. It is what we use in absence of absolute certainty. Trust is a transition thing. It shouldn't be predefined. And trust is not binary. It's not fixed. It must adapt. And extending trust implies assessing that behaviors meet expectations. So why would you need or want zero trust networking setup? 
Well, Forrester puts it quite bluntly. While 59% of IT security professionals feel that they are effective uh, at protecting the internal network, 58% faced a major security incident just last year. That's what the recent research shows. And I think that we all know this. Breaches from the inside, as well as external ones, are almost inevitable. A new technical setup and a new mindset is really required in order to combat that. In the traditional perimeter-based security uh, model, users and applications inside the enterprise perimeter are treated as trusted entities. But insider threats, which account for 15% of the breaches and 82% of all insider and privilege misuse incidents, can take months or years to detect. So obtaining user credentials is a key objective for any hacker. Some of the most impactful data breaches happened because the hackers, once they gained access inside corporate firewalls, were able to move through internal systems without much resistance. One of the inherent problems that we have in IT is that we let too many things run away too uh, openly uh, with too many default connections. We essentially trust way too much. This is really why the internet took off because everyone could share uh, everything all the time. But it's also a key failure point. If you trust everything, then you don't have a chance of changing anything security wise. On top of this, the world has changed. Many corporate applications are moving from the internal data centers to the public cloud or are fully replaced with software as a service offerings. The sensitive data is now completely outside the enterprise perimeter and could be accessed by anyone that has access to the right credentials. Therefore, any security expert's first advice will be to eliminate this dependency on passwords and add a second factor of authentication. This can be done in various ways with smart cards, USB keys and whatnot. But one of the simplest ways is to use the mobile device that you have in your pocket as a second factor, also utilizing its biometric features for, for validation. This eliminates a lot of risk. Previously, user credentials on the run could help hackers to log in, but now, uh, significantly more effort is required in order to hack. These solutions can easily connect to both internal applications and cloud services, providing one login experience regardless what the user wants to access. Perfect, but this would not help if the user's device is infected or compromised, or if the user has malicious intent to access the data he or she is not supposed to access. Zero trust networking is the concept of secure network connectivity, where the initial security posture has no implicit trust between the different entities, regardless of whether they are inside or outside. So risk optimized access to network capabilities is dynamically extended only after an assessment of the identity uh, is made by assessing the entity, the system and the context. This in practice means that the perimeter moves as close to the application as possible and provides explicit access only after assessment of those parameters together. Also for cloud deployments and services where trust works both ways from the user to the application, but also from the application to the user. We don't want the SaaS application to become a way into our corporate infrastructure. So let's exemplify this. In the first scenario, someone has a corporate issued laptop. It is connected from a corporate environment. It is connected from a known network segment. It is of uh, he or she is authenticated with uh, two factors with biometric validation. In the result of this will be that the user can access uh, 
with application access. This means that uh, these four factors have enabled the trust and will now allow the user to, for instance, use Office 365 applications like Word or PowerPoint directly on the device and access files with them in the network. A second scenario would be that someone else is using their private computer at home. They might still have secure VPN connectivity and biometric authentication, but they have less trust because the device is not corporate issued. They get access to the remote terminal server instead and are allowed to run applications in a virtual desktop environment there, but no direct access is allowed like in the first example. Then uh, in the third scenario, this person is using a mobile phone somewhere in the world without specific security connectivity, but authenticated securely. This may suffice for access to web applications, but not any other form of access. These scenarios are basic, but very, very tangible. In the real world, it's of course more complex. But as its essence, zero trust architecture has three critical ingredients. The network, the device, and the identity. And they can provide intelligence about the user and need to work together to help determine the appropriate level of access. The network aspect will, of course, provide micro-segmentation with the policies to provide or deny access, but it is also an important source of intelligence to determine the level that should be granted. So, for instance, the source address will provide, will provide information on the location of the user. If they're in the same country or if they're traveling abroad, they might be granted different levels of access. Uh, the traffic itself will reveal what encryption level is used. Information about source network settings are relevant. Uh, and is the traffic coming directly from a device or is it passing through a network atoms translation? Do we, do we have full access? Is a VPN tunnel used uh, and with what encryption levels? And what application is used to access, um, to, to perform the access request? And this can be detected through deep packet inspection. Is it a web application or is it a, an installed application or what is it? On the device side, a lot of parameters are relevant also. So understanding the level of security on the device itself is also critical in deciding the level of access to be granted. For instance, you might want to change your policies depending on the type of device, if it's a computer or a tablet. More uh, very important, if security antivirus scanning is enabled, uh, if it's updated and if the device was recently scanned. Uh, you might depend on what brand of device is used or rather what operating system and what patch level the systems are at. And finally, a fundamental question like, does this device belong to the company or is it a private unit? E.g. the origin and the ownership of the unit. It's more and more common with bring your own device allowances, but they might not be granted the same type of privileges. Last but not least, identity management. Providing secure ways to identify network users and their roles, and with that, their security clearance. So secure multi-factor authentication with focus on user usability, ideally via their phones. It can depend on the time of day, re uh, restricted per user type. Is it appropriate for this user to access this application at the time? Password level security, for those apps that still need passwords, is the password complex enough to confirm policy? Active Directory group that this user belongs to and the access level granted to those groups. If biometric validation is used or not, there might be several ways of authenticating themselves and you get different clearance depending on the level of authentication that you used. Uh, 
biome biometric validation, of course, provides the highest level of certainty that the user is who he or she says they are. And user behavior. Is this pattern of access request consistent with what this user normally does? This is where artificial intelligence becomes really, really powerful. But most importantly, they have to work together in a seamless way. There are a lot of parameters to consider that determine the level of trust earned. And it's complex, but it's also very good. Zero trust networking is about taking back control. It's not just about technology, it's about processes and mindset as well. And analysts agree, this is an unstoppable trend. According to Gartner, by 2022, 80% of the new digital business applications open up to the ecosystem partners will be accessed through zero trust networking access. And by 2023, 60% of the enterprises will phase out their traditional remote access virtual private networking in favor of zero trust networking access. And these predictions were made before the corona outbreak. I think we can safely guess that this time, timeline will be accelerated in the new era of remote working. So let's look at a real life scenario. Those familiar to us, uh, you know that we like to tell stories to exemplify. So this is Eagle Shield Bay municipality. It's a local government with a few hundred civil servants employed that are helping their community thrive. One of them is Peter. He is the IT administrator. He is in, uh, responsible for all of the municipality's IT infrastructure. This includes school systems, local government e-services, as well as local healthcare facilities. Pretty critical stuff. He's getting a lot of help from a local managed security service provider, Shield IT Partners, to manage the infrastructure and security and provide the scalability. This is John. He's the principal of the local school system. He's not the best at technology, but he realizes that his students need access and have, uh, have to practice the technology in this digital age. And this is Anna. She is John's IT manager and strategist. John hired her to make sure that there is a digital learning environment for students all ages. She has made sure that their way of working is adapted to the digital age. Students have Chromebooks and teachers have access to powerful stationary computers in each classroom. And Anna makes sure that the teachers like Sophia here uh, and her colleagues can teach efficiently from any of the classroom facilities. Since teachers have very privileged access rights, uh, authentication that can be trusted is critical. To facilitate working in a flexible way, Anna set up biometric multifactor authentication by using a mobile phones in order to both increase security, eliminate the password, and make it easy for the teachers to access the systems. Sophia is very happy about this setup. It's easy to use, uh, and it doesn't, she doesn't have to remember any passwords anymore. And for Anna, this is the first step to a zero trust setup, protecting critical services from breach attempts by outsiders, but also from students internally. Then the major pandemic hit the world and quarantine measures are enforced. People have to practice social distancing and many factories and restaurants are closed. John orders teachers and students to go home and use e-learning everywhere where practically possible. No more homeschool travel for a while and all lectures are held over video conferencing platforms. John is himself also working from home and needs to access privacy sensitive data. Because of the secure authentication and device validation, uh, Peter is able to make sure that it's John himself making access requests and can set up the system to allow access. In this way, John can reach parents' contact information, student medical files, and meeting protocols on what was decided for students with special, special needs and disabilities, for instance. Privacy-sensitive stuff. 
Sophia, however, has a much more difficult time. She doesn't have a laptop, as all classrooms have stationary systems. So when she's sitting at home, she needs to borrow her daughter's gaming PC. And Anna is very concerned about this. A lot of new devices added to her virtual network. No control on the state of them or what is sitting besides them on their local networks. A breach of the school's main systems would mean that the students' grade can be, uh, grades can be manipulated or personal data can leak out. Terrible for both Anna's and the school's reputation. Peter listens to Anna's concerns, but thinks bigger. After all, he is responsible for the whole IT infrastructure, including local government e-services and the network of local healthcare facilities. These are critical, especially now. He does not only set up multi-factor authentication for all personnel and students, he also combines this with device intelligence to determine trust. He enforces trust settings right in the network security policies. And he makes sure that micro segmentation strategy is in place to make sure the network is fully compartmentalized um, so that um, it's critical uh, for, to guard the privacy and prepare for uh, business continuity. So network setup looks like this. Schools, hospitals, and other buildings have their perimeter firewall. They connect with an SD-WAN to central locations. Internal critical servers are shielded with additional application-aware firewalls. The central anchoring point is set up utilizing the, uh, the MSSP's private cloud environment. All traffic is directed from the devices directly there, regardless if the device is at home or in the school. Access rights are decided based upon the intelligence about the device, uh, together with the access software, uh, together with the uh, authentication information and the level. And traffic to the cloud services is shielded in the MSSP's private cloud. Traffic is inspected and scanned, and uh, requests are stopped if unauthorized in both directions. So let's have a look at how this works. The teachers and students have a secure client installed on their systems. Uh, this uh, client uh, provides VPN connectivity but it, uh, directly into the sd one but it also uh, uh, scraps information about the device and sends that to the network uh, authentication server. With the connection attempt made to the SaaS application that they need to reach, it can be Office 365 or Google Suite or Wikipedia or the great administration system, whatever. Critical information about the device is passed with the request here. And if antivirus was enabled or activated, if the school device, uh, if the school was, uh, if the device was issued by the school or not, etc. The application perimeter manager uh, directs the request to the identity manager who queries the Active Directory. Information is provided about what this person is allowed to do, and a rule set is in place to uh, determine what access should be allowed. A second factor is required. So a push request is sent to the registered mobile app that belongs to this account. A decision is made uh, in the identity manager. The user is allowed access under certain conditions. This is decided, decided upon based on what validation was used and what device the request came from and where the device was located. The authentication is approved in the radius response message, uh, but the additional assignment is done in a REST API request to provision to the firewall the unique and relevant settings for this connection request. The firewall then classifies the user in a specific zone 
and grants a connection. All traffic in this zone is forwarded to an advanced threat protection unit before allowed access to the public internet. And in this way, the student's traffic will be scanned for malware and zero day traffic, zero day threats. Sophia is pretty satisfied because she can keep in touch with her students and do the best she can to provide them with the education basic needs they deserve, even though there is an ongoing pandemic. And students, they miss their friends, but at least they can get a regular routine to virtually meet their teachers and meet their study groups. And they have access to everything that they are used to from being in the classroom as well. Anna is happy because she knows with certainty who is who on the network. She has full control of the access rights to different subsystems and segments of the network. And for all outgoing traffic, full threat protection scanning is performed, ensuring the best protection for her colleagues and the students. Peter is even, uh, uh, has even implemented a cybersecurity scorecard so that Anna is in one instance can see what the security situation is and if it has changed overnight or not. And John loves this, his district has the least interrupted schooling and there is zero breach on the grade system and other systems because the MSSP provides the hosted security solution um, Costs are kept at a manageable level and only limited to the periods the access capacity is required. When everybody returns back to school, the capacity can dynamically be reduced and with that save cost. This story about uh, Eagle Shield Bay municipality is not unique. Every school in Europe is going through this right now, and it won't be the last time either. We need to be prepared and have zero trusted networking security hosted by an MSSP. This is the quickest and easiest answer to scale. The MSSP provides the elastic secure as they want that both facilitates secure connectivity between all sites, as well as added security from their data center cloud. Locally, in country, and scalable for thousands of remote students and teachers. The zero trust concept combines device status, knowledge, authentication level, network intelligence together to dynamically decide the access granted and provisions this to the solution components. So, key recommendations. The time for zero trust setup is right now. Our key recommendation is to have very, very granular control. Make sure you, access, uh, you have access to a decisioning system and it's provided with all the relevant parameters about the device, about the identity, about the network and about the request. Use secure authentication. Second factor with biometrics shall be the new default. Eliminate all uses of passwords. Use integration with uh, application firewalls to grant specific access to those who need only when appropriate and trusted. And talk to your MSSP for flexibility. This is not an easy to set up alone. It requires a new mindset and it requires solutions to work together. MSSPs can help you scale this. So, thank you. If you want to learn more, please check out our white paper. It's free and you can get a demo or a trial um, on one or a few of the components uh, and you can see what all products are used from Clavister to build an elastic secure ST1. But before we round up, I'm sure that there are some questions. Uh, um, do you have a? Yes, thank you, Thomas. We have a question here. What challenges are there when implementing CTN? 
Uh, there are, of course, a lot of challenging challenges when implementing zero trust networking. One is uh, uh, getting the information from the devices. So uh, there is a certain level of uh, integration required to, to get the right information from the device to the decisioning engine to be combined with, um, with uh, authentication. There's, there's, there's no real good standards for that. Uh, so uh, the key to this is that the, the authentication engine, the identity manager, can be super flexible, can receive many different parameters in different formats and make a decision based upon that. That's one of the challenges. Another challenge is that uh, your data center is, is not uniform anymore. It doesn't look the same everywhere. You have um, uh, data centers that you fully control where you can easily put a virtual firewall in front of it, but then you have cloud services where you have no idea how the infrastructure or security is, is, is built or guaranteed. And you're gonna need to use multiple strategies in order to provide a level of protection in front of those services. So a virtual firewall in your own data center, uh, but it may, may mean a advanced threat protection uh, outside. Um, and then uh, it is also about uh, strategizing, uh, making sure that you decide what levels of trust you accept, what's trustworthy for you, uh, and have different ways of um, uh, offering solutions to your users. If you bluntly uh, cut off access and say that users cannot access this unless they're top-notch authenticated, then you'll likely get reduced productivity and people will be unhappy about using your infrastructure. But if you uh, mitigate that and say, okay, if you access like this, then we just put a little bit more restrictions in place or a little bit more security. And if you access like this, uh, we, um, we, we allow you access freely. So for instance, on internal servers, it may be appropriate to put SSL inspection scanning in front of your internal web servers. Why would you say that? Well, um, when a user comes with a laptop from um, that has been outside and comes into your perimeter uh, and then accesses your, your uh, uh, applications, there can be malware on the devices that are caught somewhere else and um, it, it needs to be scanned before accessing your internal resources. So level of perimeter protection as close as possible to the applications uh, and adjusted to different, uh, different individual requests. All right. <clears throat> the next question, how has COVID-19 changed the working situation for you, Thomas? Oh yeah, well, it has changed quite a lot. Uh, no travel anymore, sitting at home all the time. Uh, we had to um, uh, definitely redesign some of our network assets so that you uh, can uh, can access them remotely. I don't think any mm -hmm. of our developers were used to or allowed to work from home before. Now they're allowed to work from home in certain conditions uh, if they're authenticated right and only through virtual, virtual desktops, for instance. Uh, for me personally, um, it, it has changed in all the different tools, all the different new SaaS services that we have uh, started to use in order to uh, to reach our our, our, our customers and, and have a have a kind of conversation about about security. Mm -hmm. So it has changed in uh, multiple ways, but uh, I think many of the changes are are, are good and have um, uh, become uh, made it. Uh, uh, easier to to cooperate with colleagues as well. So so I hope that many of them will stay and and uh, uh, but that we'll also be able to see each other live again. Yes. All right. We have two more here. Um, do you see zero trust becoming the default way of accessing information and services? I, I think so. It is very, very clear that you know the the perimeter as it used to be is is become irrelevant. Is not the right word, but it has become very much uh, less important in the security posture of your company. Uh, when everybody's sitting at home now, directing SaaS services directly, they're going totally past your your corporate infrastructure. Um, so you need to have different strategies and zero trust networking is an awesome strategy to gain back control 
to uh, direct traffic through proxies that you that you control uh, and and where you can both uh, uh, decide upon access levels but also provide that level of protection to your users that they that they expect from from an IT organization uh, so yes I think zero trust networking will be the default uh, I think it will be the default wherever you are um, internally or externally and the role of the firewall is is going to move more and more uh, in two ways one embedded in the network so that you know security is inherited in in the network architecture as such and then two uh, on a more application level closer to the services the applications uh, where um, um, uh, where the applications are residing all right <clears throat> Are you ready for next? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How easy is, is it to implement zero touch network in large complex and dynamic environments? Yeah, uh, it might seem very complex, but um, I think that uh, it, it doesn't have to be. I think the, 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 the first um, uh, threshold is, is, is to is to change the behavior of the user so that they use multi-factor authentication. That that is critical. Adding in a multi-factor authentication server uh, uh, in 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 between your application sort of access control flows it is not that hard. But you have to of course roll out apps. You have to have people sign on. Uh, so that mm. that is that is a bit of work. And uh, uh, Clavister with with easy access provides very very uh, good help with with these type of sign-on procedures to 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 onboard people in a very efficient way uh, but it doesn't stop there of course you you want to um, uh, make sure that you that you uh, anchor the traffic into central locations and uh, uh, scan it and, and access control it uh, there um, but once you have rolled out the the the, the authentication uh, the next step would be to to host centrally advanced threat protection with firewall infrastructure and and uh, make sure that any access requests are proxied through there. Once you have done that, it, it's a smooth road ahead because then you have full control of, of the traffic flows. Uh, mm. There's an, so, um, there's a follow up question on that actually, saying how is the functionality versus security challenge? when implementing the zero touch network. Is zero touch network sometimes seen as a hindrance of functionality? I think you're spot on there. It can quickly be seen as a hindrance uh, because um, th things are not obviously working or, or, or restricted and, and people don't understand, right? So mm -hmm. communication is very, very clear here, very, very key. Uh, that people know what they should expect from the network when they log in in different ways. Uh, there's several ways of achieving this. Of course, clear communication uh, beforehand on IT policies, but also in line in accessing uh, applications. So when you press connect on that VPN, a, a, a communication channel should be uh, established established for the VPN client to present to the user what this what is mm. all right final question here can I buy zero touch from one vendor we lost you there Thomas check and see your mic Can't hear you. On a single sign-on experience, uh, you can provide them with a single sign-on experience so that they, with one click, can go to all other applications. So mm. while there might be a slight hindrance at start, that will be uh, much easier to connect to all the services thereafter. Uh, if you if you win the, the the love from the users on that, then then it will be will be a breeze. So focus on the user experience is my advice. And, and map that map that customer journey uh, as you roll this out. All right, that's your wrap up. Thank you, Thomas, for today. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you, Anne. We'll see you in the next protects.
Bye.